Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Von Gritsen, and welcome to the third episode of Difficulty Settings Season 2. I'm so glad to have you here and I hope you enjoy what we have planned for this episode. This season we've been focusing on support system and meeting some of the people in my community that are involved in my own support system. Today I spoke with someone who plays a very important role in my support system, Cameron Costing. Cameron and I met during my post-secondary film education and we found that we worked very well together and have worked on almost every project together since, uh, ever since then. If you ever see me on camera, Cameron is almost always the person behind it. I hope you enjoy our conversation today. Thank you very much. Welcome to Difficulty Settings Season 2. Thank this you very much. This is Episode 3. Um, let's start the interview. Of course. Uh, what's your name? My name is Cameron Costain. And how are you feeling today? I'm feeling all right today. I got a good sleep. I've been having trouble sleeping a lot, and I think today I did pretty good. All right, all right. Uh, and what do you do for a living? I'm a filmmaker, as you know. I am usually the person sitting behind that camera there. Today we have no one sitting behind the camera, so we'll see how it works out. Um, I'm, I'm mostly a cinematographer and director and writer. That's mostly what I do, but I've acted before. Uh, I worked with you on My Friends Pets and on the first seasons of Difficulty Settings. All right. What do you like about filmmaking as a career? Well, while I was growing up, uh, you know, everybody always asks you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think that, you know, I never had the answer to the question and I hated the question so much. And I felt that when I was watching YouTube a lot and I liked watching short films and interview shows and I just got everything from there and, and I was very interested in how they made those things and where the cameras were when would they cut to another shot and I found myself very interested so I decided to go to school for that I just liked it because I was interested in it that was about it oh, and no. and I think that's how it should be for for some people and I think that's the biggest difference is that it's what I'm interested in after you had gone to school for filmmaking did you find that there was like a difference in shift of interest or like were you a little more hesitant were you not liking it as much did you like it more what did you find i began attending school because i was interested in it and i knew i wanted to be a writer director i began saying i wanted to write and direct i didn't know a lot about cameras and i didn't know a lot about editing and or making crazy graphics or visual effects mm. but i knew that i wanted to be a writer director and after going through the whole uh two years and everything after that i found that yeah I, it basically did confirm that that was what i was interested in was the parts that i were interested in i did find that i very much enjoyed sound design and and making soundscapes and adding sound effects and stuff um and I found that editing got easier, a lot easier for me. Yeah. Right. I find I was the complete, op well, I was the same going in. Cause you wanted so to be writer director. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. And, and Which so is, school is for everyone. Yeah, we went to school <laughs> yeah. together. I was just going to say that. I don't know how much you know, but <laughs> we were in the same class. That's same. where we met, yes. was in school, yes. Um, and I went in wanting to do writing and directing. Um, and then um, I came out of it not wanting to direct. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that you just found it wasn't necessarily that you didn't want to direct. I think it was just that the people that you wanted to direct were not in <laughs> Yeah, our I class. guess maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that's what it is. Yeah. I know, I, but the passion for like writing was still there. I think like that was one thing that I continued. I hated sound. I. Editing frustrates me so much. 
Yeah. But I did find production design. I loved production design. And you're very good at that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I had some experience producing, which was all right. I think that was pretty valuable stuff, problem solving and all right. that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's your experience like with disability? Um, I, well, I know you and you're disabled. Um, I myself, I'm colorblind, which is, I'm, I'm severely colorblind. Yep. So <laughs> it has affected a lot of my life. Um, a lot of different aspects and, and it, it's affected my career as well as my day to day stuff. I do run into I think a few different things each day that is affected by being colorblind. Um, other than that, uh, any other disability? I, I don't know. For myself, can you think of anything? <laughs> <laughs> can I think of anything? Uh, I mean you're in the process of seeing if you have ADHD. Yeah, yeah. Which is a huge disability factor on your life I think. Yeah, in many ways. undiagnosed right now, yeah. but I have met many people that suggest that to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and now you were born colorblind. Yes. So it's been your whole life. Are um, there people that are not, I think, I suppose there are. Yeah. Well, I, I you're one of them. Well, uh, yeah, I lost some color when I had pseudo Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Some red, um, different color shades I don't see as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... What do you, uh, how, what was that like? How did you find out, if you want to tell, um, how you found out you were colorblind? Yes, when I was, um, let's say, I think I was about five years old, maybe six, maybe younger. <laughs> and I was playing with what, it was a toy called a Light Bright. Do you know what those are? Yes. Yeah. They're the panels that had a bunch of different slots and it would project light through the slots and you could take little pegs, little colored pegs that you can put inside. And then there were patterns on there so you can make like faces and like boats and right. different patterns and stuff like that. Um, and I was following a pattern and putting in the pegs. And I suppose I probably mixed up either green or yellow or red or green or blue or purple or any of those <laughs> colors that I have trouble with. And my parents were very confused about the final product <laughs> of what the pattern was right. and they asked me and that was when they found out that anything was um, different and then they started they separated the pegs and they asked me what color was what and I found out I couldn't tell the difference between a few or when they were together I, I had a lot of trouble distinguishing what mm -hmm. they were like yeah and so it was it was at a pretty young age I found out I think most people find out at a pretty young age yeah yeah I think it, it it's one that happens a lot, I think, in school as well. That if, like, parents don't catch it, it usually is. It'll be in school, yeah. yeah. It'll definitely you'll, you'll be in You'll see there. it in school. As soon as you start learning colors or something right. like that, yeah. Um, with your uh, color blindness, um, what is, like, the hardest part when a whole bunch of colors are, like, together? Or, like, when they're separate and you have to tell the difference? Or what, well, what do you find? The ex ex <laughs> my experience of being colorblind there are some people who are black and white and there are some people who are just red and green or blue and purple they're, they I don't know all the names for them and everything um, but I have found that when, when I was diagnosed or, or when my doctor told my parents I remember he used the word where he said uh, it was one of the worst he'd ever seen without being black and white colorblind mm -hmm. where uh, I am affected b with red and green and blue and purple and pink and orange and green and brown and all of those. It's if the colors are similar at all, they'll blend together. And, and usually, so what it's like is, I find, is if, if, it's a, if it's mixing together or if it's sitting next to each other, it, then I have, I, that's when it becomes trouble distinguishing. I, I do have a lot of trouble with standalone colors as well, but the worst is when it's some sort of blend and, mm -hmm. and I cannot tell the difference. It all just becomes one kind of thing where it's very hard for me to distinguish like the hues and everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
this movement of having accessibility settings, which, like, I mean, even from our show, we talked about calling it accessibility settings and we talked about calling it difficulty settings because it was something that we played games, like you and I, uh, with our friends. Um, and it's something that we talk about a lot, and it's interesting to see what game does what when it comes out, like, brand new. I, yeah, it's been um, fascinating to see uh, the resurgence of it, this popularity. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, that's where the title Difficulty Settings directly came from, yeah. was stuff like that, yeah. And um, I, I love, like, in the games that I've been playing, like, having that dyslexic font. Um, that's such a huge thing. It's such an ugly font. But it helps so much. Especially it helps. You. I have seen the difference. Yeah. The information retention right. for you to be able to read the dyslexic font for subtitles and you follow along so much yeah. easier. Yeah. I and I, I think even in, in the colorblind settings, like for Overwatch specifically in in that game, because that game is so vibrant. Like the colors are so vibrant and when I'm having a migraine or I'm getting over a migraine and we do play, it's like I used to pop it into a colorblind setting to dim the colors. Yeah, I think it's, it there's a lot so of different other reasons yeah, why somebody yeah, would, would want to do that. Yeah, would want to use this. Yeah. And, and that's what I, the point I was going to get to is that I think it's not just for a certain like disability. It can be utilized in all these I d many well, that's, different ways. I think that's what we've been talking about yeah. this whole time on, on difficulty settings because... We talk about how if you make stuff more accessible and easier right. for some of the people who have the hardest time with things, suddenly you'll find that everybody takes advantage of these things. Of those if things, if yeah. you look at certain video games, they have uh, a ping system. There were there were a couple games that came out with a ping system a few years ago. Right. And it helped players who didn't speak on mic. Sometimes uh, they don't want to reveal more information about themselves right. and stuff to their teammates. Um, and you found that suddenly everybody wanted to use the, the ping, ping system. system instead yeah. of, you know, they, they co talked and communicated, but the ping system became so popular. Yeah. The, big, the biggest one for me that I think like changed the, comp like the game completely was, uh, was in Fortnite. They had the accessibility setting of for people who are hard at hearing or deaf, yes. of hearing which direction the directional audio, audio having it displayed, having it displayed there. Yeah. on your screen, and that was huge um, because you had a lot of trouble with that with the directional audio. Yeah, and, and that's which I don't know if that's not to interrupt I, you. No, no, no. Is <laughs> that, that might be some people with dyslexia yeah. have trouble with that too. Yeah. yeah, like especially. I mean, and you've seen me. You've told me to go right or left, and it's like the <laughs> complete opposite. Yeah. And I, I think that also is if I'm so overloaded on my brain, like it's so much information to, to comprehend and 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 focus on, um, and that has helped so much. And now you see everybody using it because it's it's not. It wasn't like that much of like it's not like that much of an advantage, but it is. Um, it definitely helps, and it it changed the whole gameplay. I think for Fortnite, like I have so much more enjoyment playing that game than I did before. You you can do a lot more, yeah. and it's not like the the people other players can turn that as setting on itself. It's not yeah. like you have some sort of advantage or something. I find that most people do turn that setting on and. Yeah. Suddenly, everybody's at the same playing field. It, it, there, are, there are people who can play up here, and yeah. there are people who can play up there, and what it does is it just brings everybody to, to the same field. Right. It doesn't even change the game that much. No, it doesn't. And yeah. it's such a small thing to implement, and I think that that was such a huge... Like a huge, that was one of the like this the one of the accessibility settings that I'm still like wow. That's like a big one. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Huge. Like that's like the biggest one for me. I remember because I, I had no issues with that. But even I was excited because I play with you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have, has anyone ever revealed something to you that you thought was one way, like one color, and it turns out it wasn't? <laughs> Did you plan to ask this question? I just thought of it now. You just thought of yeah. it now. Okay, so... I love the movie Shrek, and I remember as a kid, I was in Walmart, and I saw Shrek, a, a toy, it was a plushie, and I saw it on the shelf, and he looked 
like mud like his skin was like right. the color of mud to me and i think to me i don't know how to describe it like a forest green i guess and i said oh mom look at that that looks like a knockoff shrek toy right and she asked me why it looked like <laughs> like why did i think that and and the color was just so wrong to me because in the films and in everything else he is like highlighter yellow to me right. and and he is very very yellow and then i told you i remember telling you that and i said he's the same color as mike wazowski yellow and then you told me that mike wazowski's not yellow no. <laughs> and he is also green are the minions yellow? Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, wait. No? Yes, the minions, the minions, yes, the minions are yellow. The minions and Mike Wazowski yeah. and Shrek are all yeah. the same color. Those are the three. They're <laughs> all the same <laughs> okay, color. And most the likely, the <laughs> minions are what I see. That if is I were, insane. Yeah. <laughs> that is insane. I don't mean to laugh. I'm sorry, but I think it's so funny. You, as a kid, thinking it's a knockoff toy just because yes, the color is wrong. I thought it was so ugly, and I was And like I'm this. telling you, if I was a kid and I saw the toy, too, I would also probably <laughs> think it was like a knockoff toy. It um, was very funny, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for indulging me on that story, <laughs> because I love that story so much. It makes me so happy. Um, I think it's so funny. Do you ever hesitate telling people about your disability? Yes. Um, like I said before, it's I mean, when I was young, everybody was asking those questions. What color is this? What color do you see this as? Can you see this? Can you see that? Um, that is exhausting. But I don't... It's not like I think less of the people that do that. Mm -hmm. The other reason is that when I was young, I was bullied for being colorblind. And, and I think that for being, for, for colorblindness to be like an invisible disability, for it to affect not, like I, I can function perfectly well in most scenarios. Uh, and I think for, for the fact that I was bullied so heavily for it, I, I think that says way more about why bullying happens and who bullies about what. I, I think that's way, and then, then it does say about mm -hmm. me. Um, but yeah, I remember I, I've gotten into fights about it because of some of the things they said, some of the names they called me. Um, and yeah, it made me hesitate to be as open about it because uh, I didn't want to go through ordeals and stuff and play those like like the game and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but I find as an adult, it's way like, I mean, you still have to play the game, but the bullying is gone now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there a certain, um, are there certain ways that you find it hard to cope with your disability? Well, I mentioned that it's tough to go out shopping for clothes and coordinating stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of the more daily things, the ways that it affects me, probably in one of the largest ones, is that uh, when I'm cooking beef, I can't tell the difference between raw beef and, and cooked beef. And that's when it gets a little dangerous for myself with my, my disability. I need to get your opinion on it or I need to get somebody else to see it. Uh, sometimes I'll just overcook it if I'm by myself right. just to be safe. The other time is that, yeah, I, I, I do have to, if I have bread and stuff, I'll just check it a little bit more thoroughly to make sure there's not like mold that I can't see that I have trouble seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time there are other signs like smell or taste and stuff right. to to determine but every now and then I have found out the hard way. <laughs> I, I noticed like that was one thing I noticed when I when we were hanging out in person I I noticed very quickly that you rely a lot on your flashlight. Like, yes. Because your, your flashlight is a white light and you really get it in there, especially on food. I use my <laughs> flashlight a lot to just, because I, I know what it looks like under white light. Right. And I know what, it, what so it'll it'll just take away, and a lot of the lights in this house are like yellowy. Yeah, yeah sometimes yeah. it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I it, it really helps me to determine exactly what color something is. Yeah. Yeah.
do you find that you had different coping mechanisms when you were a kid versus now as an adult? As a kid, I wasn't doing much. I mean, it didn't really affect... I, I, I don't think it affected me as much. as it, It's actually interesting because, yeah, I don't think colorblindness affected me as much as a child as it does as an adult. I, I think it affects me more now because as a kid, people bought my clothes, people got mm. my... Well, my parents, people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my parents bought my clothes. They My mom would help me get dressed or tell me when something looks weird um and i wasn't really cooking a lot of food <laughs> right yeah yeah young. you weren't really cooking beef yeah yeah, when, you were yeah. Kid, yeah. when i was like in preschool yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah i think it's it's interesting because yeah it's a disability that you will deal with way more as an adult compared to when you're a kid i mean there are there are i think the 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 thing that i dealt with more as a kid is struggling with how to express your perspective right. to someone else now that part is way easier as an adult compared to the it things that does i have like to, this yeah. shift there's just new like, problems yeah, yeah yeah interesting and uh so my final question about careers is um, do you have any advice for filmmakers out there who want to make it more accessible like their film set or, or films that they work on yeah, well, that's the thing is that I bring up the problem, but what is the solution? Because money exists and people's time exists, so you can't take forever and you can't, you don't have a million dollars. I don't necessarily know the solution to that problem, but I know that some of the easiest ways to make any area or any any environment more accessible is to make people feel comfortable bringing up problems that they have or asking questions making an environment where people feel comfortable to talk about their perspectives and to talk about and 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 bring to light anything that they need so that's the first step in making changes is is helping people actually feel comfortable to talk about it right yeah having like the willingness to open and to listen yeah um to what people said and i, I think it's uh, for me it's like also like being willing to ask what somebody may need for accommodations um because i know with not when i'm not working with you and i have to work with other people and i'm not super comfortable with them yet it's like i have such a hard time asking for what i need um, so to have somebody to be like, hey, I know you're disabled. Do you need any sort of accommodation? It like opens up the first f like step forward and then it, it's easier for me to then ask at that point. Knowing that somewhat, knowing that somebody may have even prepared even just a little bit of some sort of accommodations is huge. Oh, yeah, it's, it's no, eye-opening. I, I, that means that they have thought about it at yeah. least a little bit, and that I, <laughs> means that you can talk about it. I think it's, like, the last, like, me and you have just, like, I, I've been talking to you about what I've been working on uh, besides the show, and it was the first time that somebody was like, yes, I will pay for your accommodations. Oh, that and was And I, so like, big, broke yeah. down crying because it was so amazing. Like, it was such a different experience. And it's I was I was dreading it like asking for like a support person and mm -hmm. it, it was crazy um so yeah like i think it's it's a huge difference even like the small things are like a huge difference for it it makes people having a clear mind so you can focus it it it, it makes everybody work harder right yeah I want to take this opportunity to say thank you for watching this episode of Difficulty Settings. Thank you, Cameron, for being here. Of course. Uh, Cameron will be back in the next episode because this is a part two interview, and he will be talking about his role in my support system. I hope that you can join us again next time on Difficulty Settings.